Um, we remember all the presenters to stay in time because we run already more than half an hour out of the time. So please start. Uh, thank you, dear moderator. Uh, my dear colleagues, uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I thank Dr. Zileli for uh, this kind of invitation. Now, a fusion ACDF uh, is an excellent operation. It's a wonderful surgery. We all do it. And, uh, you know, it, the results are better than a micro disc, lumbar micro discectomy. We can, uh, the outcomes are close to 100%. And, you know, it is a very, very loyal surgery because uh, uh, whatever be the indication, whether it is degenerative, trauma, infection, whatever be the indication, it's loyal to us. We always can bank on it. So it's like a loyal wife. So you, just like the society allows us, you can take her everywhere. So disc replacement is like a girlfriend. Uh, it is trying to wink at us, blink at us, flirt with us for the last 10-15 uh, years. Uh, it's like a girlfriend because you can't take her everywhere. There are limited places, limited indications where you can do a disc replacement. Now these are the hospitals where I work in uh, in uh, the crowded city of uh, Mumbai. So it is uh, here, located over here, it's this far from Istanbul. And uh, uh, similar to uh, Istanbul, it is vibrant, uh, colorful, full of activity. The only difference is the population. Uh, Istanbul has a population of 15 million, so we have a smaller population of just 23 million. So it's famous for its uh, uh, being the financial uh, as well as the entertainment capital of uh, India. Now coming to the topic, so there are, this is what I would be concentrating on. Uh, there are basically technical variations in the way we do disc replacement vis-a-vis -vis, uh, fusion. They relate to imp implant placement, the way the discectomy or decompression is done, and our stress on prevention of uh, subsidence, heterotopic ossification, uh, etc. But the most important part, the trump card, uh, that will clinch your victory is patient selection. It's very, very important uh, when you select a patient for disc replacement. This is where people go wrong uh, because of the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So when you want to do a disc replacement, it should be a soft disc herniation. There should not be any bony compression. It should be a relatively tall disc so that the disc moves. And usually these patients belong to the younger age group. There lies the tragedy because this particular surgery comes under what I call a workshop syndrome. So this is a new surgery. Young surgeons are driven to workshops to learn this surgery. When they come back, they want to practice this surgery on one of the, for the first patient that comes to them. So see, most of these patients, the disc herniation is very, very forgiving. Radiculopathy, cervical radiculopathy has 90% success rate with conservative treatment. So they find it very disappointing and they end up doing disc replacement in such cases where the patient has osteophytes, the disc space is narrow, which is not mobile at all, the patients are elderly, there is associated deformity. So then the disc doesn't move, it fuses, the pain stays, so then they are disappointed, then they say this is a bad surgery, this is not a good surgery. So these are the plus, these are the yes and these are the no's when you decide to do a disc replacement. When I learned this lumbar disc replacement, I worked with a surgeon who did 45 lumbar disc replacements in six months, and I worked with another surgeon who did 10 disc replacements in, an, in a year. I learned more from the one who did less than the one who did the more. So I'd respect someone who do, did a fewer disc replacements compared to fusion rather than more disc replacements compared to fusion, but because that is how the natural ratio works. For example, this is a 30-year-old young surgeon, a soft disc herniation. I would do a foraminotomy in this patient. is a very, very great case to do a foraminotomy. But this is one situation, you know, tall disc, young patient, soft disc herniation. You know, I did a disc replacement. So this is an ideal case. Basically, you are preventing subsidence, heterotopic ossification, etc. This is a bad case. Don't even think of doing it. It's a collapsed disc space. There are osteophytes. Uh, you need to actually reconstruct the spine and correct the deformity to achieve your neurological decompression. So this is a bad case. Don't touch the such cases. 
another young patient soft disc acute disc herniation causing myelopathy uh, an ideal case to do a disc replacement because it's a tall disc you don't have to do much bony work and uh, uh, you know it moves because of its height again another patient you can see this disc osteophyte complex anteriorly as well as posteriorly so this is a bad case short disc you know a lot of degenerative changes you need to remove bone etc this disc will not move for not more for not more than 3 months so i would do a fusion in this particular case another patient collapsed disc spaces kyphotic spine uh, you know there's hardly any mo movement natural movement already there so you need to reconstruct the spinal column decompress it indirectly by correcting the kyphotic deformity the disc will not do that so this is not an ideal situation so it comes right from case selection then comes the implant placement is very very important so when you're doing a fusion you put the your fusion device to the right left eccentric whatever you do it is going to fuse but here you need to respect the midline to respect the biomechanics of the disc so unlike uh, a situation wherein i've seen many surgeons going laterally on that particular side or on the opposite side uh, with regards to their incision here you want to be in the midline so i tend to be uh, you know extend my incision towards the center so that i am not limited by the soft tissue as well as the skin to place my disc in the center so the placement has to be in the center so the incision is quite in the center and the patient's position is neutral you can see here i mark the mandible as well as the sternum these are uh, you know superficial landmarks to see that i'm in the center and the position of the neck is in neutral in a few slides i'll come to i'll tell you why the re what the reason is and your pins have to be exactly parallel so when you fuse when you put this casper pins i really don't bother as to where the pins are i don't even take a shoot but when i do a disc replacement i have to see that these pins are absolutely parallel because the distraction has to be parallel to put your parallel this the end plates of the disc are parallel so it has to be parallel and in neutral mode if you position the patient like the way you position when you're doing a fusion because you need to contour the neck to the natural contours that is the cervical spine is in lordosis you need lordosis so you put the patient with the support in lordosis that is not to be done when you are doing a disc replacement it has to be neutral so if you do it in lordosis the disc goes this way and when the patient stands you know there is a change in the arc of rotation you will limit you will cause kyphosis you stretch the capsule and you will limit the extension so you are changing the arc of rotation which you don't shouldn't if you position the patient in kyphosis by mistake you put your uh, disc there and the patient stands up it goes into hyperlordosis it this limits flexion puts a lot of load on the facet joint so the patient has to be in neutral again it's an image guided surgery the entire surgery is ima image guided because you need to push your disc posteriorly in the ap the P, the disc has to be in the center so you know you need need a good uh, quality cm you need a good quality technician most importantly you need to take a consent for a fusion if the patient has a short neck a bull neck and especially if you are doing at c6 seven level and if it is impossible to uh, uh, get the vision uh, at of c6 c5 uh, c6 seven uh, in your lateral view so and you have to bang in the bangs you have to be uh, on the bull side you have to be in the center so you uh, mark this out. so your ap picture should be absolutely neutral there should not be any rotation and you look at this owl's eye these are basically the eyes of the pedic the, the pedicles of the superior and inferior uh, level and you know mark the disc in the center and keep uh, you know being loyal to that particular uh, landmark that you chosen again when it comes to decompression so it's been said again and again again and again during our training that you know when you do a fusion the osteophytes just fly away they just disappear that was clovered long back so you know so you know even if you do a uh, if you the uh, if you are if you're not done a thorough decompression the fusion itself can you know uh, 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 forgive you but when you do a disc replacement you need to do a meticulous decompression your decompression has to be thorough because you're allowing motion there 
So as I said, soft disc, shoe, uh, soft disc herniation is the best indication uh, to do a disc replacement. When it comes to uncinate process excision while you do remove a disc, you have to be very careful not to put an artificial disc because I have seen fusion happening. Any raw bone that is exposed will cause fusion. Again, controversy about PLL. So if you have a constrained disc such as pro disc, prestige, etc., where there's a keel which goes into the bone, the vertebra, then you know you can actually sacrifice the PLL because these are constrained discs. They take the entire load onto themselves. But if you have a sliding disc such as this, you have to be very, very particular not to excise the PLL. Again, very, very important. You can sometimes end up with a scoliotic list of the disc, such as like here. So this is uh, uh, this happens when you know when you do a limited PLL resection. So our tendency when you do, do a fusion is Excise, to excise this particular disc, you will do a PLL excision of that side alone. You will not, uh, you know, there is no need to excise the PLL on this particular side. Uh, so it, that acts as a tether. So you excise this part, this part acts as a tether. So when you push your disc in, it opens up more on the side you are decompressed. So there you get a scoliotic list. So your decompression, if you are going to remove the PLL, remove it thoroughly. Again, as I said, you know, Right, left, center, eccentric, wherever you put, your fusion device is going to fuse. Here it has to be in the midline and to recreate the biomechanics, it should be as dangerously posterior as possible uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to mimic the biomechanics of a natural disc. This is very, very important. This is a burning issue uh, that beats the very purpose of, uh, you know, uh, how you do it. I, I saw one gentleman asking, uh, you know, about, asking a question about this fusion. See, it is uh, to a large extent surgeon driven uh, 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 induction of heterotopic ossification. The incision, incidence would be as high as 65 percent. So as I said, it could be surgeon driven. It is very important to do your soft tissue dissection very, very uh, meticulously. I do not use a monopolar at all when I do a disc replacement. I either use a 50 number knife or a bipolar. I do not touch with the cautery at all. Uh, anything that stimulates bone formation, don't do it. So elevation of longus coli uh, is done with the bipolar and the knife. I do minim. I, I, if anywhere where I, if I have to drill the bone, I would just convert it into a fu uh, in a fusion. So do any bony work stimulates uh, a fusion. So there should be buckets and buckets of wash that should be given during the, uh, during uh, different steps of the surgery. And when you finish, plug all the raw, raw area with bone wax. Again, subsidence, overzealous curettage of end plate can cause this. It can alter the biomechanics. It can cause foramenal narrowing. It can alter facet loading. It can cause implant loosening. And you know, revision is a very difficult job. Again, uh, prevention of subsidence, patient selection is very important. Osteoporotic patients, elderly patients are a strict no-no. Remove just the cartilaginous end plate, bony end plate, keep it intact. Uh, and when it comes to the choice of implant, it should be one that has the largest footprint and the shortest height. Over distract, it will subside. If, if you put a smaller uh, implant, it will subside because the cancellous bone is, a is in the center of the end plate. And again, you know, when you're putting the implants, see that you remove the Casper pins because if you put place it in distraction, it's going to subside once you remove the Casper pins. So this is the strongest area. Make sure that your disc lies on this hard cortical shell of the end plate. Now, uh, I do quite a bit of uh, disc replacements, and we had issues with uh, our patients. Some of the artificial discs were too small for our patients. Some of the artificials were too big for our patients. So we looked at this. Uh, we did a study on the anthropometry in Indian population. We account for one sixth of one sixth of the world population, so it is a significant number. So these are the discs which were very popular when we did the study. So if you see uh, the AP dimension, the minimal is 1.2, and the maximum is 1.87, and even in the medial lateral uh, dimensions, it's 1.2 and 1.87. You know when you consider all these three discs. So we did a study of 70 individuals who were randomly. Uh, uh, chosen and uh, these were uh, fine at 60 end plates from C3 to C7 that were studied and we tried to fit 
these processes into these patients. And if you see, this is a very busy, big uh, table. But you look at the, uh, the crux of the matter is, so the, oh, the average of AP is 1.52. And though it lies between 1.2 and 1.87, look at the range. 0 0.87 to 2.47. What about those patients who are lying outside this bracket? 